shall we pray? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, your word is a lamp unto our feet. You guide us with your word. You have created us. You call us. You pick us up. You put us back on the right track, and you promise us eternal life in your Son, Jesus. Bless us as we come to know you, especially in your word. We thank you for the gift of your word and pray that it may continue to enlighten us and lead us and guide us. May we be people not only of word, but of action as well, so as to lead all closer to you and closer to our eternal home. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. First, a couple of quick follow-ups from last week. Someone asked, I'm not sure if it was um, Monday night or Tuesday morning, if there was any, if there was evidence that Jesus had quoted the Apocrypha, that is, those seven disputed books. First of all, if you weren't here last week and I'm talking about things that you don't know about, ask me after if you would. But we talked about those seven books that are not in a Protestant Bible, but that are in the Catholic Bible and have been regarded by the Catholic Church from the beginning as divinely inspired and fit for the canon. But someone asked, did Jesus quote those? And so I, I Googled it. And that's what you have in the back of your, the outlines. Just some examples of where we believe Jesus either directly or most likely indirectly quoted some of those books that are disputed, if you will. It's just kind of interesting, I think. I like them all. So you can read those at your leisure. It's just an answer to one of the questions from last week. Another thing that came up last week was after describing the canon, how it was set down, um, how to read the Bible, those four senses, remember that, the literal, the analytical, the anagogical, and the moral ways to read the scriptures and all of that. Some people came up and said, that was great, that helps, that gives me some tools to read the Bible, but isn't it okay just to read the Bible, just to pray with it? And I, I hope I, I, I don't think I made it clear, of course. We can all read it like that. You know, it, it should lead us to prayer and reflection. Um, what I'm giving you are just some of the background and the tools to read it, I guess, intellectually as well. But of course, you should often read, read maybe the Sunday readings that we heard or the ones to come and just sit with them, just pray with them like we do before our meetings here in the parish or before a team meeting. We'll read the gospel, and, there's, and then we pause, we may read it again, then we ask ourselves, what is God trying to say to us? We don't break it down, you know, what does this mean analytically or anagogically or anything like that. But that form of prayer, which is like Lexio Divina, divine reading, is good for all of us. So hopefully you're doing that as well. And then I believe it was here that someone said, okay, that's great, but how do you read the Bible? You know, should we read it cover to cover? And um, so we talked, as we talked about last week, you can if you want. It's pretty confusing. Um, I think it would be better to just kind of skip around. Start with something you know, like Genesis, then go to the Gospel. That may lead you back to one of the books of the prophets, which leads you back to the New Testament. Just kind of skip around. I think, I think that helps a lot. Okay. And also someone last night said, I have an app for my iPad. It's called the One Year Bible. So if you have an iPad or a smartphone, you can do that as well. I'm pretty sure that's what Jesus used in his day as well. Um, that would be really neat, you know? I mean, Jesus could have done that. He could have said, hey, you guys, look, this isn't going to be invented for 2,000 years, but check it out, you know? <laughs> okay, fine. Well, today I want to talk about the Pentateuch, that is the first five books, and the historical books of the Bible. Just like I said last week, can you imagine doing this in 45 minutes, which is what I have left? You know, going through 1,000 years of our history and 3,000 years since this has been given to us. Can you imagine kind of summarizing it in just 45 minutes? But that's what we're going to do. It's just a tiny little bit. We're just scratching the surface so that hopefully you'll latch onto something today or a couple of things and say, I want to read that. I want to read that book. I want to find out more about this person or this, you know, this author, this, this editor, however these books came about. 
Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It is the Torah, as I said, or the law, the most important part of the Hebrew Scriptures, the central part of the Hebrew Scriptures. I like this quote, it is the concrete expression of God's will for humanity. It is the concrete expression of God's will for humanity. It's something we can hold, you know, we hold the Bible, we can read it, it is concrete. It is what God wills for all of humanity. And it is the story of the formation of the people of God. If you think about that, that kind of sums up the Pentateuch. There's, it's the concrete expression of God's will for us, and it's the story of God, of formation of the people of God, us. Okay, first, authorship. For centuries, it was taken for granted that Moses was the author of the first five books of the Bible, the, the Pentateuch. Probably because Moses spoke to God, as it says in the Pentateuch, as one person speaks to another, face to face. Moses was the one entrusted with the law. Moses was the one who, throughout the Pentateuch, gave the law and gave his commentaries on the law and exhorted the people again and again to follow the law. So I believe our ancestors just naturally thought, well, if the law comes from Moses, he must then have been the author of the Pentateuch. However, with scholarship now and, um, and, and a lot of study, it seems pretty clear, it seems very clear to most scholars that Moses was not the sole author of the five books of the Bible. With a very careful eye, in fact, you can see that it's the result of several traditions coming together. Um, and that's what we'll talk about. Plus, as I said last week, Moses dies two-thirds of the way through the Pentateuch, so that also raises the question, how did he write to get the rest of it after his death? But anyway, but nonetheless, it was thought for a long time, and some people perhaps still, still um, assume that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, but I'll get back to why and what we should do with Moses. Not what we should do with him, but how we should treat him. Now, I'm going to get technical for a moment, just like I did last week, talking about those four senses of the Bible. I promise this will be the only time I do this today. But just to talk about some of those traditions that, have, that we believe came together to create the Pentateuch. It is clear that there are at least four major sources of the Pentateuch, four major traditions that have been brought together. What people have called, come to call, here we go, you don't have to write these down if you don't want, but the first one is the Yahwist source. Yahweh, it sounds like God, right? It is. The Eloist source, the priestly source, and Deuteronomic sources. <laughs> Should have written those down on here, but um, we always knew those as by their initials. And the first one is as a J, the Yahwist. It is J-E-P-D. And I heard that a lot while studying theology, and we studied about, we talked about them and the different strains that can be found. We were even given homework to try to circle which ones we thought were from the J source and the E and the P and the D. But I can't do it today. I have no idea. But nonetheless, this may help. One of those sources focused especially on genealogies of our ancestors. We see that a lot. And that's the priestly source. One focused on morality and straight storytelling, the Eloist source. Another used more imagine, imaginary and creative images, like the second story of creation, where Adam was put into a deep sleep and the rib was taken out and Eve was made from him from his rib. That's the Yahwist source. And another has worship and instruction as its focus, the Deuteronomic source. Again, although I studied these in class and remember J-E-P-D and wrote that all over my notes, I don't have a clue anymore as to how all of that came about and which one is which. But we don't have to, okay? You don't have to sit down and figure that out. It's been done for us. We don't know who, but it has been some editor. Editors have put it together in what we have now as the Pentateuch or the Torah. But, if you think about it, this does explain a little why when you read the Pentateuch, there is so much repetition. There are two stories of creation. You ever asked, why would that be? 
It's funny when people say, well, I believe in the Bible literally. It happened as it says. Well, I say, but there's two pretty different stories of creation, so which one is literal? Or there's two, at least two different accounts of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And there's two accounts of the Ten Commandments. They're the same Ten Commandments, but two different versions. And so you see a lot of repetition. Deuteronomy, the last book in the Pentateuch, is a repetition of a lot of Leviticus. It's because these sources were all kind of stitched together to form one document, if you will, or one book, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Okay, going back to Moses, we of course don't want to deny Moses his rightful place at all. He may not be the author, the way we think of an author today, but we know that he has a tremendous role in all of the events of the Pentateuch, all the events of the giving of the law and the instruction in the law, especially in his discourses and in his exhortations to the people. In the New American Bible, it says, Moses is the lawgiver par excellence, and all later legislation is conceived in his spirit and therefore attributed to him. So that's how people came to attach his name to the Pentateuch. Because he is the lawgiver par excellence, we figure that all legislation is kind of, kind of flows out of that, flows out of the Ten Commandments, certainly, and out of the law of God. Since he was the one to whom the law came, obviously it was inspired by Moses in his spirit. So that though he's not the main author, probably, he certainly, his spirit, his influence is found throughout the Pentateuch. Okay, now let's open it up. The message of the Pentateuch is basically it's about the birth, the call, and the promise of the people of God. The birth, the call, and the promise of the people of God. It can almost be summed up in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, 7. And I have that on the handout. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, 7. I'm going to read it even though you have it there. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the communities of the earth shall find blessing in you. And then verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So that really summarizes a lot of what the Pentateuch is all about. God calls us, equips us, and then gives us his promise of eternal life, or the promised land, if you will. Does this sound familiar? It should, because it continues today. All of us are called daily as individuals and as a church. God equips us with the sacraments, the prayer, the worship, the liturgy. God forgives us of our sins and keeps before us the promise of eternal life. It's this pattern that continues over and over and over again in the Bible. And so when people say, ah, the Old Testament, that's so dry. It's just history, you know, it's something that happened so long ago. How is that relevant to me today? And I say, ah, it's happening today. It's alive and active. God is still doing what God did way back there. So looking at it back then, the Pentateuch reminds us, oh yeah, God is still calling us, giving us the tools we need, forgiving us, and leading us to eternal life. I love this stuff. That's why I put that quote again from Hebrews, the word of God is alive and active. One thing we see throughout the Pentateuch and throughout the Bible is that it's never easy. It'd be nice to say that God called us and we all said, here we are, God gave us the law, we did it perfectly, and God gave us the promised land, we just marched right in. But as you know, the story of our ancestors is a story of impossible odds, strange twists and turns of events, um, odd or miraculous gifts, and ultimately the fulfillment of all of our desires. Again, does this sound familiar? If you're like me, your response to God's call is not just a straight line, you know, yes, I'll never break a law, everything's going perfectly, but we waver, we fall back, we fall down, and yet God picks us up and sets us back on track again. I thought about some of these impossible odds and twists and turns 
Maybe you can think of others, but here's just some of them that I thought about. And you probably know some, if not all, of these. But the fall of Adam and Eve, right off the bat, after God gave us everything, we broke the law. It could have all been scrapped right there. The murder of Cain, right away we have our first murder, a horrible thing that happened, but God didn't give up. The Tower of Babel, when our ancestors were so filled with pride, they thought they could build a tower up to God, maybe be as powerful as God. The Great Flood, when God said, that's it, I'm tired of this people, I think it might have been a mistake to create them, I'm going to start over. And he did start over with Noah and his family. The story of Joseph and his brothers, remember that toward the end of Genesis, his brothers sold him into slavery because they were jealous. And somehow, what, a, what an incredible story, it turned out that he was an official in Pharaoh's court and actually was in a place later on in his life to save his family and to help to lead the Jewish people, the Israelites. The sacrifice of Isaac. God had just recently told Abraham and Sarah, you will be the parents of a great nation, as numerous as the stars of the sky, the sand and the sea, sand and the shore. And they have their firstborn, and now God says, okay, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. And it doesn't say, but I'm sure they're both like, you gotta be kidding me. You just said that we were gonna be the parents of a great nation. You want us to kill our first and only son? And God said, yes, until it came, to the moment of truth and God stopped it. So it's God's way of saying, I do not want human sacrifice. And also of, of pointing us toward what would ultimately come, the sacrifice of Jesus, God's only son. Um, okay, Jacob and Esau, that's, that's another great story and a twist of events. The golden calf, the rebellious people, and finally entrance into the promised land. There's so many of these stories throughout the Pentateuch and the Bible. In Exodus and Leviticus, we get God's laws and decrees, and also story after story after story of how we broke them. It's wonderful honesty and humility. You know, people say that history is usually written by the victors from the point of view of the victors, and so it looks so grand and glorious because we won, right? Well, that's what's so amazing about the Pentateuch. You would think that our ancestors would have skipped that stuff about the murder, or about building that tower, let's not put that in there, that makes us look bad, or the great flood when God said, I'm tired of these people, or the golden calf, let's not put that in there, but they did, thankfully, it shows wonderful honesty and humility, and it just shows our humanity, because it continues today, unfortunately, in all of us. The Pentateuch leads to an attempt to evoke a human response, a response from the people of God. God has presented his laws and decrees, now it is up to us. Or, in the words of Moses, and I have this down, Deuteronomy 6, 4 following, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. There are some typos. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Take to heart these words which I enjoy on you today. And then finally, right at the end of the Pentateuch, at the end of Deuteronomy, we have Moses' great exhortation to the people. And I'm going to read it to you in full. It is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 to the end of the chapter. Here then I have today set before you life and prosperity, death and doom. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I enjoin on you today, loving him, and walking in his ways, and keeping his commandments, statutes, and decrees. You will live and grow numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to occupy. If, however, you turn away your hearts and will not listen, but are led astray and adore and serve other gods, I tell you now that you will certainly perish. You will not have a long life in the land which you are crossing the Jordan to enter and occupy. I call heaven and earth today to witness against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life then, that you and your descendants may live, 
by loving the Lord your God, heeding his voice, and holding fast to him. For that will mean life to you. For that will mean life for you, a long life for you to live on the land which the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Pentateuch, the Torah, gives us God's love, gives us God's answer, if you will, or God's communication with us. Moses then exhorts all of us, his contemporaries and us even today, to choose to follow the Lord so that it may go well for us. Every day we are asked to recommit ourselves to God, to choose life, life eternal with God. This shows something very interesting, all of the Bible does, but especially the Pentateuch. From the creation of, the, I'm sorry, individually and as a whole, when the people are faithful to God and to his law, we are prosperous and we have God's protection. When we follow false gods and sin and lead ourselves away from God, disaster overtakes us. It's another theme that runs throughout the Pentateuch. Okay, now a quick summary of the five books of the Pentateuch. First, Genesis. Genesis covers from Adam and Eve all the way to Jacob, our ancestor. From the creation of the world, from the Hebrews' point of view, to the call of the people to Exodus to Jacob. Now, Genesis is not really interested in the history of humanity as a whole. In fact, this is completely ignored when we come to Abraham and beyond. From Abraham and beyond, the focus is only on the Hebrews, only on our ancestors. They're not so interested in talking about other tribes, other nations, other ways of life. It's not intended to give a history of the world, just a history of the people of God. This is all history of God's self-revelation, what we call salvation history. Let me say something about Adam and Eve. Are, is, it, is that story literally true? Did they exist? Our ancestors, Adam and Eve? Well, the answer is, we don't know if there were literally people named Adam and Eve who lived um, in, at one time on Earth. The story falls under the category of myth. Now, when I say that, people think, oh boy, there you go, it sounds like a fairy tale. It's not. A myth is a way to tell a truth which we have come to know in ways that we accept and understand. We need to remember that it was not the author's intent, or the author's intents, if there are a couple of authors, to take things, to tell things literally. Besides, there are two accounts, as I mentioned, of creation. Remember the one about God creating the world in seven days, and the other about God creating Adam, and from Adam, Eve. Two different stories. From the introduction to Genesis, again, in the New American Bible, we read, to make the truths contained in the first few chapters of Genesis intelligible to the Israelite people who were destined to preserve them. They needed to be expressed through elements prevailing among the people at that time. So again, their intention wasn't, here is a history of the whole world, we're going to present it for all time. It is for us, for the Hebrews. Here's how we understand it. Here's how we express how God created it, us how sin entered the world, and how God promised us salvation. With the patriarchs, Adam, Isaac, I'm sorry, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we finally can start to see when all of this happened. It's not perfect history, again, in a literal sense, but we begin to get things. It's around 2000 BC to 1500 BC. That's when a lot of the Pentateuch, we, we think, took place. Genesis teaches us many things. It teaches us creation and humanity's special status in God's image. It teaches us about the transcendence of God. God is above. God is all-powerful and everlasting. Yes, God loves creation. God is intimately involved in creation. We are created in the image and likeness of God. But nonetheless, we see again and again, especially in the Pentateuch, God is transcendent. God is above calling us to be in union with him, but above nonetheless. In Genesis, we also learn the call and the origin of marriage. We learn about the sin of disobedience and the promise of the great blessing. 
remember all the way back at, at the time of the fall of Adam and Eve, when God was doling out the punishments for the man, you shall have to toil and work the land for your food and your livelihood. For the woman, you will have the pain of childbirth to remind you of this sin. And for the serpent or the snake, God said, you will strike at the human's heel while they strike at your head. And one day, I will raise up from the woman an offspring who will crush you forever. And that, of course, is Jesus. All the way back in the first few chapters of Genesis, we see the promise of a Savior, the promise of a Messiah. Exodus. We're moving on to Exodus. Exodus is basically concerned about the exodus of our ancestors from Egypt. Jacob's descendants are growing now. The Israelite community, people are growing and growing. And so um, now they, we see that they are, unfortunately, at the hands of the Egyptians, being oppressed. They are slaves. And so this book concerns God's deliverance of the people in the, at the hands of Moses. Um, it tells of the miraculous deliverance by God through Moses to Mount Sinai, right up to Mount Sinai, the site of the covenant. This is very important, of course, as a part of our history. People are saved. People are given the law in order to make them holy people. And once again, it continues today. We may not be slaves in that sense, but we're slaves to sin, to habit, to temptation. And so we believe God comes to us and saves us again and again through his son, through the sacraments, through the church. Leviticus. Leviticus deals mostly with laws, ritual and sacrificial laws. And if you've read it or tried to read Leviticus, you know it tells you how you are to wash cups and kettles before you use them, how you are to wash your hands, exactly how before you eat a meal, how you need to purify yourself after you have done something, after women have had their menstrual period, how they need to be purified. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And that's why a lot of people, when they read the Bible, they get to Leviticus and their eyes blaze over and they just close the book and they think, that's why I would read the Bible. But it still is very interesting. The, the, the goal here is to be pure, to respond to God, to have this state of external purity as a way to show that we want to be pure before God. The central idea of Leviticus is summed up in this refrain that you will read again and again and again. It's like a refrain of a song. Every once in a while after giving laws, it says, you shall be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. So it's God saying, here are the laws, here is the way you can become holy, because I am holy, and I want you to be like me. Jesus referred to the law constantly in the Gospels. He referred back to Leviticus, mostly because it sounds like he wanted to get rid of it, but he didn't, as he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law, I've come to rescue it and fulfill it. He accused some of the Pharisees and the scribes of making the law so hard, so literal, looking at it so literally, that they forgot about the Spirit. The goal of the law was to lead us to union with God. And Jesus came to say, I'm here to lead you with union to God through love, through sacrifice, through obedience and humility. Follow me, and I will lead you to the Father. What I love about, um, what I love about the Bible, and I've said this a lot, is that, again, even with Leviticus, it looks pretty dry, it looks pretty boring, it looks pretty academic with all of these laws. And yet, if you remember that one message throughout, why do we have all this? Because God is calling us to union with him. Isn't that amazing? Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I mean, that's pretty awesome, pretty intimate, pretty tender. God has given us all of this so that we could be in union with God. Okay, Numbers. Numbers, why would that be named Numbers? Well, basically because it deals with two censuses of the people. One at the beginning of the book and one at the end of the book. So it's called Numbers, sure enough. The story continues for 38 years from the end of the encampment of Mount Sinai to the threshold of the Promised Land. So Numbers really consists of history of 38 years while they wandered in the desert. The events describe the actions of God 
who punishes the people for their lack of belief by prolonging their journey and also preparing them for the promise. So, you know, there are a lot of jokes. Why were, why did they wander for 40 years in the desert? You know, some people say, well, it's because they didn't have GPS or they forgot to take maps with them, or because it was mostly led by the men who hate to ask for directions. I'm sure you've heard all of that. But really, if you read it, you see that it's because the people grumbled again and again. Why did you bring us out here? We don't like this food. We don't like the water. We should have just stayed in Egypt. They grumbled continuously, and so their journey was continued. Kind of interesting. But throughout, you can see God says, all right, you're sinning again, but keep going. Keep going. You're going to get there. And again, this continues today. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. It's a repetition, a completion, and an explanation of the law given on Mount Sinai. Moses exhorts and corrects and even threatens the people to retain past their past glory. Again and again in Deuteronomy, it's Moses saying, we can do this. Our ancestors did this. They were slaves in Egypt. Remember how God called them out through with all these miraculous signs and wonders. How God led our ancestors, our fathers and mothers, through the desert. And now, God asks us to be faithful. Faithful as we cross into the promised land. To receive what God has promised us. The aim is to enforce the Lord's claim to their obedience, loyalty, and love. Now, if you thought the numbers was short, that's only 38 years, Deuteronomy describes the events of 40 days. The crossing of the Jordan into the promised land. Basically. Um, and it's, we, we know, I think you probably know, you should know, that Moses, even though he led the people out of, out of Egypt through the desert and everything and gave them the law, he was not allowed to lead our ancestors into the promised land. That's what I mean about dying. He died before they entered the promised land. Um, and we believe that, it's, as it says, this came about because Moses was disobedient. He didn't believe that God would fulfill what, what God said he would. Specifically, when God said, I will make water flow from the rock. Remember that? And in one, this is repetitive because twice it mentions that. Once it says, you shall say to the rock, you know, give forth water. And in another one, another one a little bit later, it says, you shall strike the rock with your rod. Well, Something happened. Moses struck the rock twice, at least twice, and then water came up. And later on, it was revealed that that was an act of disobedience or an act of unbelief. The way I like to think of it, Moses had all those people there. They were grumbling. They were probably threatening him with his life if he don't give us some water. And he says, don't worry. It's going to come out of this rock in a minute, all right? I imagine him saying that and then saying, come on, God. And nothing happened right away. And then he struck it with his staff and nothing happened. No, really, God is going to give you water, you know, and then it gushed forth. That's the way I like to imagine it. But anyway, because he did that twice, he was not allowed to go enter the promised land. He saw it, he was on a mountain and he saw it in the distance, but then he died and Joshua led them into the promised land. Don't worry though, they took Moses' bones in with them, his remains, and they buried them in the promised land. Okay, um, lastly, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy at least, well, several times, but we know that the famous ones are twice when he was in the desert in his 40 days, which looked a lot like the wandering in the desert, kind of related to that. He had that exchange with the serpent, and he quoted Deuteronomy three times. And then also when the lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all? He said he quoted directly Deuteronomy, as I put down here in, your, in, the little, um, in the outline, he quoted Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and soul. Okay, now, the historical books. First, there are three that, that really are kind of in between. We, the Christian community, has, have put Joshua, Judges, and Ruth in with the historical books. The Jewish and Jewish canon, they put Joshua and Judges along with the prophets and Ruth in what they term the writings. We put them all in the historical books, but they're kind of in between. Um, they, clearly, they're a continuation of the Pentateuch in our history and how we survived 
in the Promised Land. It's a continuation of the conquest and God's protection of the Israelites. It foreshadows and prophesies spiritual conquest of the world through the church under the leadership of the Messiah. Joshua, as I said, is the successor of Moses, so the book is named after him and his, his, his and our ancestors, uh, their, their journeys through into the Promised Land, their struggles at first and how they established themselves. Judges, the purpose of the book is to deliver them, read from introduction, sorry I didn't have this down, I got a lot from the introductions in the New American Bible to these books. So if you read it, you say, hey, you just read from that. You're right, I did. The purpose of this book is to show that the fortunes of Israel depended upon the obedience or disobedience of the people to God's law. Whenever they rebelled against him, they were oppressed by pagan nations. When they repented, God raised up judges to deliver them. So this accounts, this talks about the 12 judges that led the people at the time. Now they were never, there was never a judge over everyone. They were judges over little tribes or little local communities, local groups. Remember, God said, you don't need a king and queen over you like the pagan nations. I, the Lord, am your God. Just follow the law and everything will be well. But in time, because of disputes, because people had their understanding of the law, God sent them judges to help them to to kind of interpret the law and to settle disputes among them. Of the judges, there are a couple um, famous ones. The most famous one would be Samson. We know a little bit about the story, mostly because of his long hair, but there's a lot more to them. So hopefully you can read through that and learn about the judges. Judith, I'm sorry, Ruth. Okay. Ruth, show, Ruth is a very interesting book. It's fantastic. It shows how piety and fidelity can be rewarded even when practiced by a non-believer, by a pagan, if you will. Ruth was not part of the Israelite community, but she was grafted into it. She married Boaz and became part of the Jewish community. In fact, because of her piety, because of her devotion and the way she embraced her new faith, she is honored as the great-grandmother of King David which is fantastic. Here's someone who is outside of the community, marries into the community, and becomes a great, uh, a woman who is honored as the ancestor of David. What do you think this might show to us? It shows the universality of salvation in Jesus. That it's not just the people of God, or the Jewish people who get to be saved, but as Jesus and later Paul and Peter would say, Salvation is for all who accept it. See how a little knowledge, I wrote this in there actually, see how a little knowledge will make something like the book of Ruth interesting? Now hopefully you want to read it. And you can. It's only a couple of chapters long. But it's a really neat story about how this woman embraced this new faith and how she became and still is an honored person in our history today. Okay, now the other historical books as titled. They cover from Judges to the Establishment of the Monarchy of Samuel, Saul, and David. There's a century of leadership among those three. Most important in the first books, especially 1 and 2 Samuel, is that the, is, is it shows the promise to David of the eternal reign through his descendants. Samuel is named after the leading figure who was called by God from an early age. Remember that story, Samuel? Samuel, God called him at an early age, and he anointed David, the king of Israel. Second Samuel is mostly about David's history. It concerns what David did and how he struggled and how he was successful in ruling the people. Remember I said that God said you don't need a leader, you don't need a king or a queen over you? Well, at the time of Samuel, the people were saying, we know you said that, but we want it. Our neighbors had kings and queens, and these, 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 uh, these people who lead them, we want one too. So God reluctantly gave them Saul, David, Sam, Saul, Samuel, I'm sorry, Samuel, Saul, David, and Solomon. He said, okay, you asked for it, and, and it was good, but it's just, it shows an important part, important important uh, development in our history. 
1 and 2. Wait, I want to read this. Sorry. I want to read from 2 Samuel. Do I have that down in your thing? Sorry. I should be a little bit more, more prepared while I'm on Samuel. Samuel 2, 7. Okay. Here, the thing that's the most important, as I said, in Samuel is that it shows us God's promise of an eternal king in the line of David. The Lord reveals to you, David, that he will establish a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. It is he who shall build a house for my name, and I will make his royal throne firm forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Now the people of that time took it literally to mean this was David's son, Solomon, who built up the house, the first temple. But we read it, and we know that God is also speaking of his son, Jesus, who would reign forever. One and two kings deals with four centuries of leadership, from David to the Babylonian captivity, and the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem around 587 B.C. Okay, they had their king, everything was going well and all that, but because they were unfaithful to God, they were led into captivity. The temple was completely destroyed and abandoned and desecrated, so was Jerusalem. They were in exile and they were completely lost without their temple, without their place of worship. Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah can all be seen together. They detail, or they talk about, the return from the exile and how our ancestors literally rolled up their sleeves and got back to the law and back to building the temple, the second temple. It talks about the rebuilding of the temple and the recommitment to the law. Ezra was a priest who basically single-handedly rallied the people to come back to the law. Remember, they had been in exile for many, many, many years, and they lost the law. They, they were following the laws of their captors. They started to go after their gods and worship them. Ezra called them back, called them back to worship. And he literally did that by reading the Pentateuch, by reading the Torah to them from beginning to end. And at the end, he says, just like Moses, it's up to you. What will you do? What are you going to do now that you have heard this? For that, Ezra is known as the second Moses, even today, by the Jewish people, because he called them back to the law. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah is like the patron saint of lay people, people in the church, most of the church, that is, who, like, like so many of you, work and say, we need to do this. We need to build up the church. We need to bring together all of our resources and do this again. Nehemiah helped to convince the people to get going on the temple, to rebuild the second massive temple. Okay, a couple more minutes here, we're gonna move. We've got Tobit, Judith, and Esther. Tobit, Judith, and Esther are more like religious novels than they are history. And they don't even purport to be literal history, but they're more like religious novels. You need to know that when you read it. You know, again, like I said last week, there's history, some of it is meant to be taken literally, some are parables and other stories, some are apocalyptic writings. These are religious novels. The purpose is instruction and edification. Edification means for our enjoyment, so that we learn certain lessons, but they're also for our enjoyment as well. Not many people think about the books of the Bible, but they are. Now, Tobit, what an amazing book. Are you familiar with this? You probably are familiar with some of it. But Tobit is just a great story, a collection of stories, some of which are fantastic and humorous. It was said that as this book was read to our ancestors or by them, they would probably laugh every once in a while. You're, that's ridiculous. That would never happen. But that's not the point, again, to take it literally, but to see the underlying message. Like you know about um, Sarah, Sarai, in the, um, in, uh, am I getting this right? Yes, I am. In the book, she marries seven men, and they all die on their wedding night as the, before the marriage was consummated. 
because there was some spirit. God did not want that to happen. And so it's great that we get to Tobias, who is betrothed to her and marries her. And it says, and this is read at so many weddings, here's where it starts. On their wedding night, Tobias says, Sister, let us pray. Well, it's because seven other men had died before him in that bed. In that bed. And he's just like, uh, let's, let's say a prayer. And it's so funny because so many couples choose that because it's a nice reading for their wedding. But they probably don't know the backstory. You know, they don't know that seven men died. And so Tobias says, Sister, let us pray. But it's really great. Oh, and then the next morning, after they've consummated the marriage and everything, Sarah's parents come and they look in the chamber and they're like, Hey, he's alive! <laughs> and they throw, they throw a big party. You know, it's just, it's a great story. You know, and we can laugh, but really the underlying theme is prayer. Praying to God, being faithful to God. And that's what I talked to the couple about on their marriage, on their wedding day. I don't necessarily talk about the other seven people who died. Or later, Tobit, you know, is worn out and weary and falls asleep and a bird defecates in his eye. Remember that? And it causes blindness or cataracts. They call it cataracts. And then the angel, Raphael, comes and heals him and gives him his sight. Again, I think people would have laughed and they would have thought about Tobit sleeping there and a bird, you know defecating his eye that caused blindness. But the story is God heals. God sends his angels and his messengers to heal us. It's really, really a great book. And there's other accounts as well. Judith as well, again, is maybe not so humorous, but it's a great story. And it teaches us about God's providence. Judith looked around and saw that her name means Jewess. So she really represents the great Jewish women in history. But she looked around and she saw that the men were not going to, to rise up in battle. And so she, kind of like Joan of Arc later, led the people and destroyed Holofernes, the commander of the army who was terrorizing the Jews. And it's pretty brutal. She took his sword, cut off his head, and held it up for the people, you know. So it's a great story. It's filled with a lot of tension and drama and this great thing that happens in the end when she saved the people. God still works through the people, through all people. God is active and saves his people. That's the lesson of Judith. And Esther shows the glorification of the Jewish people and the origin and the significance and the date of their feast of Purim, which they still, still celebrate today. It shows how God works through impossible odds, again, at the prayers in the hands of a woman, Esther. Esther was married to the king and she heard of a plot to exterminate the Jews in her day. And so she has this great prayer. Please read Esther, it's a great book. She has this great prayer in there where she says to God, God, I'm going, into, I'm going to speak to the lion. She called her husband the lion. Even though she was married to him, she had no right and no business speaking to him, much less about policy. But she said, I'm gonna go speak to the lion. Put your words in my mouth so that your will may be done. And she was trembling as she prayed that prayer. She went in, spoke to the king, told him about this plot that she heard about. The king was enraged, and because of her, turned it around and destroyed the person who had come up with the plot and saved the Jewish people. They regard her today still as one of their saviors, if you will. And, and again, here we go. You know, we say that this is old history. It's happening today. Every time that I preach or give a talk, I pray and I think about Esther because I love that woman so much. I love her story. And I don't, I don't consider you all lions that you're going to devour me. But I do say, God, help me say what you want me to say today. May your words be in my mouth. And so I'm kind of thinking about and praying to Esther, our ancestors in the faith. Okay. It shows how God works through impossible odds, as I said, to lift up the lowly and to bring down the mighty from their thrones, something Mary would extol later in her Magnificat. Now we come to the, the Maccabees, the 1 and 2 Maccabees. Even though it's called 1 and 2 Maccabees, they're not, this number 2 is not a sequel of the other. They're two independent accounts of the revolt of the Jewish people in light of their attempted repression. It takes place in about the 2nd century BC. Once again, fidelity to the law expresses Israel's love for God. 
And it talks about a great battle. Certainly people are put to death. People die. There are martyrs in Maccabees. But overall, if you step back and look at it, it's not so much about humans killing other humans. The great battle is to be loyal to God's law. And it doesn't matter. This is interesting. You don't have to be a Jew. Even Gentiles who are loyal are on the right side. The, the battle is to be with God or against God. The Maccabeans' revolt helped to establish briefly the independence of the Jews. The first book shows God's unfailing support of the Jewish people, even in the midst of persecution. And the second book gives us teaching on the resurrection from the dead pretty clearly, it's pretty neat, on the intercession of the saints in heaven, on the work of the angels in our lives, and the prayers that should be offered for the dead. Thus, this is an important book for us Christians, especially us Catholic Christians. And again, this will show you probably why it's not found in the canon of the Protestant Bible. Martin Luther thought, wow, these are things that go directly against what we believe, and yet we Catholics hold on to it and say, it's right there. It's always been venerated and, um, and upheld as canonical, and we see it as such. Okay, and the final quote comes from the Bible itself, again, from the introduction to the historical books, which come right after Ruth in your Bible. Right before Samuel, I like this a lot. This kind of sums it up, especially Samuel to the end. But it really speaks of all of the Hebrew scriptures. Samuel to Maccabees demonstrates that before, as well as during, the millennium of history with which it is concerned, Israel was a covenanted people bound to Yahweh, Lord of the universe, by the ties of faith and obedience. This required observance of the law and worship in his temple, the consequent rewards of which were divine favor and protection. In this way, these books anticipate and prepare for the coming of him who would bring type and prophecy to fulfillment, history to term, holiness to perfection, Jesus Christ, the Son of David, and the promised Messiah.